Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Niche Pursuits News. And uh, we do indeed have a lot of news to cover. Uh, Google just recently came out with their earnings report. And so there was a lot of really interesting tidbits from that earnings call. And then a couple of interesting things that have just come out, brand new tools. And uh, yeah, some other interesting things. But of course, to talk about it with me, I've got Jared. Jared, how you doing today? Oh man, always a good day. We're talking Google and the weather. Seems to be a trend these days on the uh, on the weekly podcast, and we're talking that about a lot true. of both today. That is true. A lot of Google, a lot of weather. I know you guys uh, in California are you know getting drenched on right now, trying to survive out there. It's it's pouring rain. No one knows what to do with themselves. I've got myself a cup of tea here. I mean, I'm really trying to settle into this rainy day lifestyle that you talk about. That's right. That's right. And um, you know, I didn't plan for this, but I happen to have a weird niche site that is related to the weather. And so stick around for that. Um, well so we will indeed be talking about weather quite a bit, but uh, let's start off with some of the Google news, shall we? Um... Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. This campaign got us big links in websites such as Lifehacker, Wells Online, Daily Record, and about 20 other news websites. Let me show you how we've done it. We knew that people will be flying a lot this summer, and we knew that journalists will be writing about this topic a lot. So, on behalf of our client, we put together a nice guide about how to fall asleep on the plane. Then we use Muckrack to find journalists who write about travel. Then we put our advice in a nice email and send the tips to the journalists. Within just a few days, the links started landing, securing our client natural placements in really big websites, just like this, this and this. This is a great example about how you can leverage seasonal trends to earn links to a website. Anticipate what journalists want to write about at all times and give them the stories that they need. They will reward you with some great juicy links. I hope this is helpful. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. You know, Google just had their earnings uh, call on Tuesday, I believe, two days ago. And uh, I actually listened to the earnings call just because I thought, you know what, maybe um, Sundar Pinchai is going to talk a little bit about SGE, AI. Maybe they'll mention some things of how they're, you know, organizing their SERPs and some things that we might apply. And sure enough, they talked a lot about SGE, a lot about AI and things that are coming out. And um, over at Search Engine Land, they did a pretty good job of kind of summarizing that call. And so I, I just wanted to hit on some of the things that, um, that were mentioned. So um, I will just simply say that after listening to the call, generally the the thought that I had coming away with this is that, boy, maybe they are not getting rid of SGE or search generative results. Uh, we've kind of hinted at, hey, maybe they changed some of their language and some of their docs that makes it sound like um, it's not going quite as well as they thought. And that may still be the case. We don't know. But certainly the CEO and all of the, the leaders there at Google are talking like SGE is something they're investing heavily in. They expect it to do very well in the future, and they have no plans of slowing that down. I don't know how many times SGE was mentioned, but it was a lot mm. uh, during the call. I believe it was actually uh, maybe the first big item that they talked about. Uh, they lead in with a couple of things, you know, their earnings and other things. But then they talk about different business units. And I believe that SGE and ads, uh, using AI for ads, were, were the first two uh, items that they talked about. So it's on Google's mind. Uh, it doesn't sound like they're backing away from uh, SGE. They're investing in it more and more. Um, and there's you know a couple of quotes maybe that I'll just read. Uh, from the CEO, he said, uh, we are already experimenting with Gemini and search where it's making our search generative experience or SGE faster for users. We have seen a 40% reduction in latency in English in the U.S. I'm happy with what we are seeing in the earliest days of SGE. Um, 
And this was an interesting point that they touched on and talked a little bit more than just this quote, but he says, uh, we are improving satisfaction, including answers for more conversational and and intricate queries. As I mentioned earlier, we are servicing more links with SGE and linking to a wider range of sources on the results page. And we'll continue to prioritize approaches that add value for our users and send valuable traffic to publishers. Now, of course, we've talked about this and looked at examples, but within the SGE results, you might get 10 links, and those are not the same 10 websites that are in the organic results. So that's what he's talking about, a very diverse, um, a wider range of resources that are being linked to in um, SGE. Uh, And then, yeah, I mean, overall, you would expect nothing different than the CEO to be very positive, but he says, you know, they feel very good about the progress. The 24 is uh, going to be very strong, both on search and the underlying AI progress, including the model. So they're very excited about what's coming ahead in 2024. And so that was kind of the overall tone and theme, at least as it related to SGE, that they're excited about it. They have a lot of plans. Um, he did qualify some of his statements saying that, you know, execution is key. They certainly need to execute on a lot of their plans. And there's certainly some technical challenges that they're still overcoming, but they have a very positive outlook. So maybe I'll pause there and see if you have any thoughts on all of that, Jared. Uh, well, first off, kudos to you for go- jumping on an earnings call. You're taking this podcast to the next level. That's right. That's right. You got to <laughs> step up your game if you want to keep up here. I mean, uh, I read an article on it, so I don't even know if I'm qualified to comment on it. You're here. You're listening to the earnings call. I mean, next next month, you're going to end up having an interview with uh, with the CEO, you know? And just There we go. If you're, fire if you're listening chat. in, Google, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're available. Um, we're available. I thought there was a lot in this, and certainly as it relates to some of the stuff we've been talking about. I think it's possible for what we talked about last week, which is SGE not doing well, to exist in the same world of what we're talking about this week, which is that the CEO of Google can be very pleased with where they're at with SGE, because I think that he does drop a lot of breadcrumbs here about how SGE is only like a small part of the overall vision and picture of what they have for, for you know, kind of generative AI. And I, uh, I thought that at least this is the first time I've had it hit me in the face so hard, at least again, from reading some of the quotes and stuff. Um, he talked a lot about the breadth of search. Few people understand the breadth and how we, our task is to really utilize generative AI going forward to fully encompass the breadth of search. Um, something that he mentioned that I've seen Marie Haynes mention actually quite a bit is the fact that assistant, Google assistant will be um, very complimentary is what the, uh, he said yesterday, but just a bigger part of things going forward, almost eluding. And this is what he, the, the article talks about eluding that, um, AI in Google's mind becomes more of an assistant to you rather than just a query based response. Um, and again, I don't want to breathe too much into that, but that's just some of the things that seem to come out of this. And, um, and then he, he said, uh, think about the future and maybe go beyond answers and follow through for users even more. So again, that's kind of piggybacking off what I just said. Like, so it seems like SGE might not be going well. And at the same time, there's still so much more for it. I, I feel like you can almost have both sides. Right. I agree. Like they are certainly not backing down from the notion that they're going to invest heavily in AI assisted search, whether it ends up being the SGE as that final product, or if it's more implemented, like you said, as an assistant, some sort of agent, it kind of talks about here of like, it, it just makes it faster for you to find the information that you're looking for. And where that ends up exactly right we're we're still maybe in that uh transition period a little bit but uh that quote that you did allude to just about the breadth of search i found it really interesting and there was a little bit more than just what is kind of summarized in this and i wish i could find that direct quote but it just always kind of um it kind of always makes me happy whenever the ceo of google talks about the long tail of search right that's always been my like joy in life is finding long tail keywords and he had you know a couple of great sentences related to that basically that's what he's talking about is that when people underestimate the um the breadth of search he says the amount of queries we see constantly uh on a new day and to clarify new queries that they see every day Uh, so they're still seeing a lot of new queries that they've never before seen in the past and he talked about that uh, in the sense that it's a little bit of a challenge to train an ai model because they're seeing new queries new types of queries every single day 
And when the CEO talks about the breadth of search and new queries and how big <laughs> this long tail is of search, like I, I don't know, I get excited about that all the time of like, oh man, there's like still this opportunity. There's long tail keywords out there. There's untapped potential. There's going to be a new opportunity tomorrow that didn't exist today because people are searching for new things all the time. So um, that was really just fascinating to me. One thing I thought was really interesting, I'd love to hear your take on it because it does dovetail in the back of uh, what most analysts consider to be poor earnings results, especially from the ads department. And I thought that he talked a lot about ads. And I think for people that listen to this podcast, I, I, I pulled a line out that I thought was really interesting to me and I thought was really positive. First off, from a high level, I think he talked more about publishers in this call than I've ever heard him talk about publishers before. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever heard them talk about how they actually care about sending traffic to publishers, at least as it relates to generative AI. Not saying they don't care about it, but to hear it publicly, uh, maybe, and, and maybe it has been said before, but I can't remember one. But moving beyond that, he talked about how they're trying to work ads into SGE, and they've been experimenting with that. We've talked about that a lot here in this podcast. What are they going to do about ads in SGE? Because at the end of the day, they're an ad company. And he said, we've also found that people are finding ads either above or below the AI-powered overview helpful. Um, and to me, that suggests basically that people are, are still scrolling past a lot of that AI stuff to get to the organic results and thus the ads that are below those those AI results. So yeah, just another little feather in the cap about how like um, there's as there's opportunity for those of us who 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 rely on content from Google just as much as there's uh, potential challenges ahead. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, there was a, a line uh, on the call that he said just that they are uh, doing their best to send both qualified leads to you know businesses that are advertising. And they're still trying to send that valuable traffic to publishers. They want to find a good match of you know providing great answers, providing great lead source, but still sending that valuable traffic to publishers, us at the end of the day, right? Web yep. Website creators. So they definitely mention publishers and the importance of publishers. Um, so so that's good. Um, and then um, the other uh, brief point that I wanted to make that. Part of the reason that the Google stock actually went down is, like you alluded to, uh, they missed their uh, ad revenue projections or uh, ad, ad revenue grew, right? Yeah, but the way stocks work is yeah. that if if they miss the analyst estimates, right, they came in less than, I don't know what the number is, but whatever the analyst estimated, they came, came in a little less. The growth wasn't as fast as Wall Street wanted. Um, and so the stock has come down um, I, a little bit. I was going to ask you about that. I know you have a little bit of a banking history, so you're probably a little bit slightly more qualified to talk about it than me, but I read the headline to prepare today. I was thinking this would be a good topic. I knew their earnings report was coming out, and I was like, oh, man, they missed their earnings report. Oh, my goodness, they're losing money. And then I dig in. I'm like, oh, no, they grew. They just didn't grow as yeah. much as they were supposed to or hoping to grow. So I'm like, well, yeah, that makes it a exactly. bit of a difficult thing to talk about, at least for a, a non-expert in that kind of space like myself. <laughs> right, right. It's just kind of the way that Wall Street works, right, is – um all these analysts put out projections like here's what Google's going to do next quarter and they say you know it's going to be whatever a dollar 63 earnings per share and um and so if they come in at a dollar 62 earnings per share like it's still they made billions of dollars but it wasn't quite as good as what Wall Street wanted and so the stock might come down a little bit uh and and one other thing that was a slight negative uh and, you know for for analysts at least is that the capital expenditures that Google had specifically as it related to AI, um, was much bigger than anticipated. So they're spending a lot more money making, you know, capital expenditures, right? That can be all sorts of things, new servers, new, new technology teams, et cetera. Um, that's increased a lot. And again, on the call, they said that is because of AI and how much we're investing in AI. We're building out this huge infrastructure and we expect this, these capital expenditures to be high for the foreseeable future. Um, and so that's part of a reason why the stock is down a little bit because, boy, they're spending a lot more money than we expected. And Wall Street's like, you know, is this a good idea, right? Is this going to really pay off their investment in AI? But that that's the case. That's the strategy for Google.
So not to not to bring it to a close, but to almost tie it to last week a bit, because I feel like as I read this article, I think from the energy in your voice, I feel like being on the call maybe gave left you with a similar belief. Like it just feels like what a cool mission for Google going forward. And look at all this opportunity and all this um, just really cool stuff. If you're like a technologist to be working on trying to figure out these big goals and challenges that the CEO alluded to, and it dovetails so interestingly to last week where we featured a big, big story from a, uh, an engineer about how awful and how demotivating, unmotivating of a place it is to work and how there's no leadership and no one knows what to do. And everyone's looking around at each other for answers. And it's just, it's very hard these days to understand what's going on. If I didn't listen to last week's podcast, I would have no <laughs> idea that there's the other side of the coin because yeah. this is such a kind of positive approach that Google has from a senior leadership level to next year. Yeah. And can both of those things be true, right? That's what you kind of have to find out as as the average listener, because of course the CEO and the leadership team are going to come out very positive, strong forecast, you know, we're doing all these things, we're going to have great payoffs in the future, but um will will that be the case? I don't know. You know, when I again from an outsider looking in, my own perspective is that a lot of times, at least in recent years, Google has always kind of played catch up or copied other um, products, right? That the people have, it's like, well, oh boy, the iPhone is just crushing it. So we better have our own phone. So we got the pixel, right? Uh, uh, Facebook is crushing it. We better have our own social network. So they tried Google plus and other things, right? That didn't end up working. Um, and it feels like AI could be that similar pattern, right? Large companies tend to do this as they see an upstart. Oh, open AI is just crushing it with, with um, AI and having their own chatbot. So we are going to show that we're a part of that and we're going to invest heavily in that. And so, um, so is it true leadership? Are they just copying what they see or other people doing? Uh, but they have the real dollars and the real teams to truly build some of these things into a reality, right? And so even if they are second or third or fourth to the AI race, they still might be the, the overall winner at the end of the day in five or 10 years. Um, so, so we'll see, but, but that does lead us in directly into our next story here that just today uh, was announced that Google Bard now can create images. Um, Speaking about coming in second by a wide margin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mid journey, you know, is been been doing this for a long time and open ai with dolly three right has been doing this for a long time yeah uh but uh, now directly in bard you can uh create images i mean that's that's basically the long and short of the story story is that um and i believe this uses their oh what model is it uh uh the it's called the imagine uh Imogen 2, powered by Imogen 2. Anyways, that's their model uh, that they are using. So here's just some examples of images on the screen that these were provided by Google, right? This is kind of their press release. Like, hey, here's some bard generated images. So they're pretty cool. I mean, this looks like a real plate of chicken wings, if you ask me. Uh, yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. That's the one I'm looking at right now. Yeah, no, that's that's good looking uh, I got plate of wings right there. Unlike our uh, unlike our weird niche site last week, where the the lighting wasn't quite right. Sorry, pro photographer speaking here, but the lighting is spot on in those chicken wings. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, and uh, I I did play around with the tool a little bit, um, and it, <laughs> I mean, it, it did okay, right? <laughs> these these tools are very hit and miss. Um, you know, one of one of my queries. Uh, it it said sorry we can't create an image on that. It, I don't think it was what? any. You were always I, breaking Bard. Are you you and Bard have a thing? <laughs> Bard and I are not off to a you know a good you know good start here. I I, I think it was something like a, an angry politician walking down the street of of New York City. Oh, that should be uh, easy. And it said no. Sorry, we're not going to do that. <laughs> So uh, maybe I did something wrong, but the other images I asked it to create, it did create. And I know you actually um, have some examples here. I did. I mean, I was reading this article preparing for the podcast this morning, um, uh, just in the morning while having my cup of coffee. So I asked it to, to I, 
you know, I try to get into, I tried to get into to seeing how well it would do if I gave it specifics, right? Like a lot of the press relief examples are like, show me a dog surfing. And it's like, well, okay. I mean, you know, uh, that's broad. <laughs> what do we do if we get specific, you know? So I asked it to give me an image of a cup of coffee, but I want it to be in the early morning. I want it to be with warm sunlight pouring in through curtains. I want it to be in a breakfast nook style table. I thought it did a very good job. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a couple of your uh, shots here and uh, it, yeah, it did pretty good. And um, what's cool is that, I mean, Google Bart is free, Yeah, right? I mean, Google Bart is free. And so um, right now it's just chat GPT plus that will generate images. Uh, and then, of course, Midjourney now is a, is a premium tool only. I, in the past, a few months ago, you could do free stuff, but no longer. It's it's only a paid tool. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Google Bard is one of the few. I you know offhand, I don't know of any others, but Google Bard is free, right? So if you want to generate AI images, go check it out. It's brand new today. You know, you must have triggered their offensive content uh, limitation with uh, the politician where I think that... Maybe, maybe, <laughs> right? <laughs> Everything like, politics nowadays is offensive. Yeah, and, um, you know, as I understand it, it won't generate images of specific people. It won't. They have right? a named so named people a, filter, uh, whatever yeah. that means, but yeah. Yeah, so I won't name names, but, you know, maybe an angry politician in New York City will, you know, pull somebody up specifically in their database and it said no we're just not going to do that um I, I have no idea i think i know so, what you might be alluding to well you know i don't know i don't know of course not of course not no i so um so try it out i've only done a handful and uh, it does generate images and um yeah so it's uh i don't know it's it really is kind of a fascinating world we live in i mean even just about a year ago Right? Was this even really a thing? Maybe a little longer than a year ago, but not much longer. No, like you no. couldn't I even mean, generate images with AI. I don't know if imagery was. Uh, I mean, we're recording this obviously at the very end of January, beginning of February. You know, and I don't, I don't know where we're at on the imagery side of things. Certainly, ChatGPT had been out for a couple of months, but imagery right. did follow. And again, we've had, you know, we've had. AI before chat GPT, but I think, you know, what we're really talking about is a landscape shift of its public use. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that is big news, you know, for publishers, you might be able to use this on, on social media. Uh, I don't know, Pinterest, uh, maybe even, you know, in your blog posts, I will say, and you, I don't you know what that? this means exactly. Yeah, you saw that. I was going to bring but it, it up. It is. Yeah, it is. Uh, all images uh, created by Bard are marked with the uh, Scent ID digital watermark. Um, I don't know what the, exactly that is, other than they are traceable. They do know that, hey, this image was generated with AI, specifically with BARD. So if you're using it on your website, how does that impact your website? I don't know, other than Google knows that Google BARD created it. Yeah, I don't know much so, about it either, but but they know. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. just something that you should be aware of, right? You should know, mm -hmm. you know, see so yep. influences your decisions on its use and where you use it and that sort of thing. Yep. Yep, exactly. So All right. Now, um we have one other news story that is kind of interesting because it involves somebody in the niche pursuits community, right? It's somebody that has been um, you know, on the podcast and is um known among niche pursuits listeners right and so uh this uh brandon um saltamachia did i say that right we just uh, called him brandon salt on the podcast for that very random salt let's okay brandon <laughs> salt uh that's he, easier yeah and uh, he had um boy his his website retro dodo is uh, been hit hard by the helpful content update and a lot of his new content that he's been publishing or trying to update, it will kind of get indexed and do okay. And then a week or two later, it just, it, it drops out of the index or isn't getting any traffic, right? And so it seems like all his articles are just kind of getting penalized for some reason. And so he posted this just publicly on, um, on Twitter, you know, asking for help. Does anyone have any explanation uh, to why some of our articles are not showing up in the SERPs at all? Right, I'll update an article, it pops up, and then it drops and disappears again. It's frustrating. 
Uh, and then, wouldn't you know it, but Danny Sullivan, he jumped in. The official Google search liaison, he jumped in, and he actually provided some very specific feedback, which uh, is is pretty cool, I think. So, um, and, we, and we can go through all of this, but I don't know, any, any thoughts before I jump into the specifics here? Well, you know, I mean, it's uh, – uh, there's been a lot of stuff like we, I think it got left off the agenda, but there's just been a lot of stuff in terms of Danny's, uh, uh, I don't know if a newfound approach or just that he's acting a little differently on Twitter these days. I don't, I don't really know how to sum it up. I mean, uh, a week or two ago, he had a very ominous reply to a tweet that basically it was using a, a GIF. <laughs> go, go get him, Danny. I love, yeah, I love that Google's yeah. all about the GIF replies. Sweet. <laughs> but, yeah. It was basically saying like a massive update is coming and it's coming very soon. And we haven't been able to prioritize that as a topic here on the podcast to talk through. But um, that's not something I don't think he's ever hinted at before or done. It's certainly not in that kind of charismatic sort of a way. But right. um, I don't think we've seen a response from him like this on Twitter where he actually kind of analyzes like almost like uh, does a 10 minute deep dive of what he sees as being off on this. And Again, overall, it's really encouraging that he's willing to wade into some of the challenges that we see, like, hey, how do I evaluate this? And again, like you said, whether right or wrong or whether it makes sense or not or whether we know what to do with it and all those questions, outside of all that, it's just kind of nice to see him getting into more details rather than staying very, very high level. I think that's been a frustration all of us have had over the years is like sometimes the high level responses don't help us very much. Yeah, no, exactly. And so to, for him to take a specific example, because, right, we always – kind of uh, poke fun at him for saying, oh, you know, create helpful content for humans. Well, in this, he tries to go through and provide, again, uh, a very specific example. So they look at a very specific URL, uh, and then Danny comes through here and says, okay, here's a few things that generally might not be uh, helpful, right? Uh, and and a right. lot of it, yeah. He's yeah, right he about most right. of it. He's, I, I, I wouldn't even say most of it. I can't, I can't remember anything he said that I didn't think was true. Mm hmm yeah. Um, a lot of it kind of came down to, okay, uh, Brandon had updated the article, right? And so it's got a new date of, you know, January or whatever. And then there's, there was several things like he's reviewing, um, what are the decks called? I don't know. Um, gaming decks. Here, here we go decks. again. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Steam deck. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're starting to wade into fuzzy waters here. Don't with dig the a hole again, deck. Spencer. <laughs> Just keep it. <laughs> steam decks. I do know what a steam deck is. Okay, actually. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, a lot of the steam decks were, uh, referenced in the article and they not even been released yet. Like it was kind of a, the, the article is 10 steam deck alternatives and some of the steam decks hadn't even come out yet. Right. When they first published the article and well, now some of those steam decks that hadn't come out now have come out, but the article was never updated. Right. To, to kind of included that. So, um, that was a lot of it, like the timing. It's like, okay, well, if somebody's reading this article and it talks about a Steam Deck that hasn't even come out, why is that included? Uh, and if it has come out, why don't you have any information about it, right? So um, anything else that you kind of noted in Danny's response that you thought was interesting? I thought it was interesting his... It, 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 he almost kind of walked you through his discovery process specifically as it related to the videos. And yeah, that's I, right. I was very intrigued by that because I've always been intrigued by Google's relationship in their online, you know, in, in how they evaluate an article as it relates to video, right? Like how much do they correlate what's in a video that you embed? How much do they understand that it's you, that's your account that's doing that video or if you're embedding somebody else's? How much influence does it have? We know what video does to time on page and to users, but what do they do when it comes? And I'm not saying that he revealed the algorithm here, but he definitely kind of walked you through like, he's basically kind of like, yeah, this article did not seem to have much original content. And then he kind of said, the first time I realized you knew what you're talking about was when I actually looked at some of your videos. Right. I just thought that was interesting, you know, like that, that's, I don't know if that uh, has any indications to how a bot works, how their algorithm works, but I did think that was interesting and it certainly gives people food for thought for how they think about what they do with video and where they place it yeah yeah danny basically kind of said hey kudos you seem to be like an expert after watching your videos you do have hands-on experience but You've i didn't actually, get that from your article is what he kind of but said from the article 
I don't get that. I, I don't see that expertise. So just embedding a YouTube video, even if it's a view, maybe isn't providing enough signals. Is that kind of, yeah, you know, that, that's yeah, certainly and, one aspect of what I'm taking from what Danny's saying. And I talk to clients, I have people that we do website reviews for, or that we'll even get into like content plans and, and helping them out on a monthly basis. And, you know, a lot of the times the examples that get used for the helpful content update specifically are for people who don't have very much expertise and Google's trying to, to take them out. But I will tell you, I look at a lot of websites where people have lots of expertise in their field and they have done a bad job of showing that to Google on their website. Right. And so I see a, a good amount of that. And, um, uh, you know, in this case, the expertise was in the video work and perhaps, and I, I don't know anything about steam deck, so I wouldn't even be able to tell you, but perhaps not as much in the content on the web page as well as much, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, again, yeah, kudos to Danny for jumping in and kind of responding to some of that. Um, you know, if people want to dive into this, I think it's an interesting Twitter thread that uh, people can read through and kind of uh, at least see how Danny is thinking about content. And of course, if that's how he's thinking about content, right, he's taking that to the search team and they may implement, you know, certain things, or at least he has a little bit uh, uh, of an inside knowledge of how search works a little bit better than the general public. So it, it does seem that Danny really does not like it. If you update your publish date and everything in that article is not current. Yes. <laughs> I'd exactly. say that's what he harped on the most. <laughs> he did indeed. A lot of things <laughs> felt out of date. Yeah. Uh, and so make sure that's uh, congruent with what you're doing. So. so for those of you who change your title every year to 2024 review, I'm not saying it's not to do it. I'm just telling you, I don't think Danny's going to like it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> I don't think he's going to like it at all. Uh. Uh, <laughs> all right. Very good. Uh, so I think that covers uh, the news. I mean, there actually, we had double the number of topics yeah. on our uh, uh, sheet, but we must move on. We've got we ended other up things with, to talk uh, about. We ended up with the Google trifecta this week. We did. All Google uh, this week. SGE, Bard, and Danny Sullivan. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good mix of Google topics. Yeah. You know, so so maybe... With my side hustle here, my shiny object shenanigan, I'm going to not talk about Google. What? Uh, and so we're going to change it up. So if you people started. are sick of us here, you know, talking about Google, we're going to talk about something else here for a second. Hey, everyone. Spencer here, founder of the Niche Pursuits podcast. Last year, the traffic to nichepursuits.com more than tripled, with most of those gains coming from Google. In fact, I finally hit the 1 million page views per month milestone. In order to achieve this growth, my team and I publish over 100 articles a month. The final step for each of those articles? We build at least one new internal link to that article using Link Whisper. This helps index it faster and helps it rank better in Google. This also helps us avoid having any orphaned posts in the future. If you want to give your new articles the best chance possible, you need to build a process around internal linking when you publish. It only takes a few seconds with Link Whisper to get suggestions and check the box next to the internal links you want. They are all built automatically once you've made your selections. No need to go into each article, find a relevant sentence, highlight the anchor text, and add the internal link. Link Whisper does all this automatically once you've made your selection. If you want to try out Link Whisper, just head over to linkwhisper.com and use coupon code PODCAST at checkout in order to get $15 off. Um, so I've got, uh, yeah, my, my shiny object uh, shenanigan here is the same as last week in terms of topic, right? I've got this uh, Facebook page that I've been trying to grow. Um, and I, of course, a website associated with that. Again, the overall goal is to get as many followers on the Facebook page. We post content two or three times a day, which we should probably ramp that up. But um, those posts link to our website. And so a certain number of people click the link, they go to the website, I make ad revenue. That's the business model, right? And so I've been diving a lot more into Facebook, trying to get things uh, to do well. Uh, this week, I actually am playing a little bit more around with uh, just engagement overall. In the past, almost all of our posts are just articles to our website that they get engagement and some do really well and some don't do very well. 
but you can do a lot more like just sharing images that don't link to anything or just posting a question that doesn't link to anything just to get more engagement with the end goal of being if you get more and more people engaging with your page the next time you do post a link more and more people a higher percentage of your following will see that link so that's that's the goal um the one kind of cool thing that i just wanted to share is that in order to build up a facebook page like the the common practice is to run a likes campaign mm -hmm. and you can get likes on facebook for relatively cheap right the, my goal has always been between five and ten cents per follow follower uh per like on the page and so i just started uh three since our last uh podcast i started three new likes campaigns um one of them was getting likes at like i want to say 16 or 17 cents a like well, uh, so i just i just uh killed that one the second one i started was either 11 or 12 cents i'm gonna let it keep running uh for a couple more days just to see what happens and then this third one and i'm gonna just share it on my screen here uh since that's you know interesting uh, I don't think I'm revealing anything, but uh, okay. this last one is at seven cents uh, per like. Hey, uh, and so I, it's only been running for two days, but it's in my my golden zone, right? Between five and ten cents a like that I'm happy with, right? I just had ten dollars per day as the spend, so you can see I've only spent eighteen dollars and forty two cents in two days, but it's gotten me two hundred sixty four uh, followers or likes at seven cents a like. And you can kind of see some of the stats, you know, for post engagements, reactions, um, and and then the the demographic breakdown, right, uh, of everything. And I I will just say that I spent hardly any time, right? Like you find yeah. an image and you write, it's like two sentences. Like one is like a sentence about the image. I I won't say the exact thing, but you know you can get the idea. Right. If it's uh if it's two puppies playing together, like I don't know, this is probably a bad example, right? But hey, do you do you love you know cute pictures of puppies? Right. And then the next sentence is like our page if you want to get more cute pictures of puppies, right? Type thing. And that's all it is. And they can click the click the likes campaign. Um, and so that's how I've been building the page and then of course there's a lot of organic likes and things that happen uh over time but that's just a little bit of progress on my page you know i've tried out three campaigns i'm gonna try and start doing more like trying you know one or two new campaigns almost every day until i've got maybe three or four ads running that are all mm -hmm. in that five to ten cent like campaign and try and build up the page even faster and then hopefully actually get to profitability uh quicker uh than than you know just letting it go on forever so so that's my quick update um hopefully people find that somewhat interesting you know it's just a little side hustle that i'm working on and uh little progress each week it's so interesting to see like it, you know <clears throat> certainly a lot of stuff that uh people will talk about involves large budgets and you hear these large budgets being spent on Ad campaigns are different things, but I mean, you're, you're spending $18, right? Like on this one, mm -hmm. you're trying out yep. a couple. So fair enough. It's, it's more than that. But I mean, that's a very approachable number for anyone, even someone just trying to get a Facebook page off the ground. Like, yep. you know, it's not long after you can, you can, you can get started with a budget like that pretty quickly, you know? Yeah. And one other point that I'll make that will tie into my previous side hustle of Amazon influencer program. I hear from so many people like, what if I'm not an influencer? I can't get approved to the Amazon influencer program. And I've always said, well, why don't you just start a Facebook yes. page, run a likes campaign? I think you only need about a thousand followers to get approved. Like here I am, right? 264 followers in two days within a week, you know, and spending a hundred bucks, 150 bucks, right? I have a Facebook page that probably can get approved to the Amazon influencer program, right? So anyways, and figure out how to tie it together and you can actually use that Facebook page even better. And yep. maybe, maybe with your Amazon influencer videos, maybe not, but yeah, then now you actually have more of an engine to drive traffic. Yeah, exactly. Because the, one of the perks of the Amazon influencer program is that you are allowed to, to paste your, or put your affiliate links 
on social media, on Facebook. And so yeah. it's totally legit. The Amazon Associates program uh -uh. is not legit, but the influencer program, you can paste your affiliate link in your Facebook page that you built up. So, um, well, yeah, to your point, has like, a, you should be building a social following of some sort for some business, some side hustle of yours in general. And then the influencer program gives you yet another re way that you can monetize that. Like if you didn't have an influencer program right now, an influencer mm -hmm. account right now, like that $18 would not only be going towards building you a Facebook page that will eventually yield you profit. It would also be helping you build up towards getting an influencer account. So now your ROI on that $18 and beyond is even better used. Right. Exactly. Now the, the caveat to all of this, right, is that you have to actually be active on the Facebook page. You need to post a couple times a day, but it doesn't have to be complicated, right? You can post a one sentence question. You can post an interesting image, right? Just to make sure you have some interaction with that group. Uh, because Amazon will look at the actual interaction yeah. of the group yeah. as long as in addition to followers are people commenting and liking, but it's not that it, it's not that hard, right? If people spend 30 minutes a day, even, uh, or, or maybe even less, just depending on what it is, you can probably get a page to a point where you can get approved like a couple of weeks, a month, right? Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's just a little, uh, I don't know, just sharing what I'm doing and a couple other thoughts. Uh, as it relates to that, but um, I'll keep sharing my progress here to what, let people know how uh, the page is doing. What are you at in terms of total number of uh, followers or like likes? I mean, what, it, what are we calling? Yeah, it's just over forty-five thousand. Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've run likes campaigns on and off for a year. You know, um, at a lot this of point. Yeah, so it's getting there. Like, Good. I'm gonna double it. What the heck? You know, let's get to a hundred thousand and start start to get serious about this thing. <laughs> Uh, that'll be a good update. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Yep. What do you, what do you got for us, Jared? Well, last week I shared that uh, I have a goal of four public speaking events. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I had, so a couple of things, uh, from that I had, um, uh, one person reach out to me and invite me to speak at their conference after hearing about it here on the podcast. Does Whoa. that count? Does it count if I, uh, if I if I get the benefit of the podcast to, to pad my numbers, I I can't see why that doesn't count. Are you saying, well, maybe you should increase your numbers? <laughs> I'm just saying, like it's it's uh, like it's not an advantage, you know? <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, I, I don't know. So they're gonna send over details. I did get a couple other people reaching out about some other speaking opportunities. I had um, somebody reach out uh, to me and and say like, oh man, I get asked a lot to speak and I can't do it all, and I speak about similar topics. Maybe I'll refer you. So. Um, uh, good response so far to that. And, uh, that kind of has me, you know, doubly motivated. Um, I did, uh, very simply just ask one of, uh, uh, our other people that work at 201 Creative to go out and research, um, uh, a list of of conferences that are happening in the next 12 months that would be a good fit for the different topics that I might want to speak on. And so now I do already have a list. It's about 54 conferences, so many conferences. Did you know that? Wow. I know that many that are very like niche dependent, like there is a furniture conference. Were you aware of this? Uh, no. And we have several clients in the furniture business. And so speaking hmm. to furniture clients about marketing would be a topic I could talk about, for, for example. Um, mm. and so I, I think at, at first glance, 54 seems like a lot, but then when I start thinking about it, I'm like, there's probably way more than 54 and I just need to find better ways to kind of, uh, give my, um, assistant like a little bit more prompting tools and things like that to find even more of them. When you kind of drill down, there's like, say SEO conferences and marketing conferences, like, um, like HubSpot. I talk about how I, um, have, have gone inbound a lot uh, and I like that conference to general marketers, but then there's conferences for like every industry known to man. Um, and, and each of these, uh, people come to them who are professionals and, you know, one of the topics or two or three of those topics at that conference might be on marketing that kind of business. So there's a lot of opportunity out there and I'm only, I feel like skimming the surface on it. Yeah, no, I agree. There are so many conferences for everything, everything out there. So. So more to come, but I'm still at my one uh, conference book. These things take a little while. You don't just kind of, you know, exchange three, three, uh, three emails and call it a day. But I'm still at one, but making progress towards my goal of four. Maybe, maybe I can knock up my goal of four here sooner rather than later. But um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Spencer, I didn't hear from you on your January numbers from Amazon Influencer, but I am prepared to share mine. 
go right ahead. I'm curious to hear. They are as bad as ever. <laughs> uh, uh, a couple of things. So, so, I mean, we knew they were going to be bad, right? Like everybody listening knew that. You don't even have to have any experience in the Amazon Influencer Program to know that January is going to be bad. I've never had a January in the Amazon Influencer Program, and I knew it was going to be bad. I didn't have to ask anyone. We just know January is going to be bad on a consumer-driven shopping platform. But mm-hmm. um, So I made $1,486.67. Down sharply from over four thousand dollars in December, uh, quite a bit down, more than quite 50% a drop. Down. Um, uh, clicks on my videos were down just over fifty percent from December. Hmm. Shipped items were down just under fifty percent, and so what that meant is that I actually had a higher conversion rate in January than December, and that actually kind of surprised me. Hmm. That is interesting. It's not dramatic, but it's a couple percentage point, one or two percentage points higher from December. I would have thought conversions, conversion percentage would have been off the charts. It looks like the reason so many that we make so much money in the month of December in Q4 isn't really because uh it's just because so many more people are buying. It's not necessarily because we're converting better, I guess, if that makes sense. Right. There's just so much more traffic yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Um and so it, what it came down to as I drilled in is it came down to the shipped items revenue as they call it. Um so the amount of revenue from the the items that my videos influenced um, a, a purchase on that was down sixty seven percent. So what it really means is a lot of what I talked about coming out of November and December that I realized is hey in this Q four time period people are buying expensive stuff they're buying luxury stuff they're buying things that maybe you know they don't need but they want um, uh, you know this kind of stuff right that they bought more expensive stuff because my shipped revenue was down 66% when my shipped items was only down by less than 50%, right? So the amount of money people are spending per product dropped quite a bit. Yeah. Mhm. Well, how do you think uh February is going to go? Like do you think there's going to be much of a a change? Uh do you have any sort of thoughts or projections going forward? Well, I'm not going to get myself into the hot water Google does by projecting what their revenue is going to be and then having to have their <laughs> stock price demoted and dinged That's because right. they didn't yeah, Jared's stock. Is, I don't need Jared's decreased. stock getting dinged even any more than it already has. I mean, you you're know? you're trying to speak. You can't. Uh, you I know. My come stock in price is going up. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, <laughs> if I were a betting man, I'd say February's going to look a lot like January. You know, and I haven't really been doing much. Right, I did end up uploading eight eight videos in January. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but um yeah, so uh so yeah, uh I I I I don't have any broad plans to get back on that uh, video train. I am going to do videos in 2024. So it's not like I'm just letting it go, but mm-hmm. um but uh but I don't have any you know, immediate plans to make more videos and I don't see consumer trends changing much between February and January, so probably more the same for February. Yeah. No, I think that makes sense. I um uh, didn't come prepared to share my earnings, but uh, I was just a little above where you were at. I was I was sixteen hundred and fifty ish. Okay, something yeah. like that. Which pace is almost the same, considering you were up on me in December too. Yeah, yeah. Actually, by a lot. By actually, no, you were way above me. Yeah, in December. Yeah, I was. Oh. I was about six thousand for oh, for man. December. So how so you're like twenty five percent? Yeah. Uh huh. You know. You're the peaks and valleys, and I'm like the steady Eddie kind of thing. If it, if there is a steady Eddie in, right. in the Amazon influencer program, and, and like like I talked about in in December, I had one product or type of product in particular that just exploded. So I think that's a big reason uh, for that. So, anyways, that's that's uh, that's my short update. But um, no, that's that's good to hear. Amazon influencers still. Um, Still moving along. It doesn't sound like you're going to publish a thousand videos uh, this year. I don't plan to publish another thousand videos uh, this year either. But uh, still, still an awesome program. And I will be curious to see how long the videos continue to perform well. Right? Do they start dropping out more and more? Do they stick around? Are there several that last for years? I big question mark. I agree 100. percent I mean, it's going to be a fun year to look at from a totally different perspective than we did last year. Yeah, I agree. Well, maybe we will go ahead and jump into our weird niche sites since we only have you know another 10 minutes or so here. So um, we'll go ahead and, and share uh, our weird niche sites. Uh, one that I found is a little bit different. It's it's very niche, 
Uh, but it's not so much a content business. You know, a lot of times we cover uh, content businesses that are doing well in Google, getting a lot of traffic from Google. Uh, this is not the case. And as I teased in the introduction, um, you know, I do plan on talking about the weather. And so uh, the niche website I'm talking about is weatherembed.com. Embed, like you embed something into something else. So weatherembed.com. And it, I mean, it really is more of like a SaaS tool than, um, you know, a content business. You come to the homepage. I mean, it's very simple. Yeah. It's like one sentence. Uh, okay, weather embeds for newsletters is the headline. And then the sub headline, instantly generate a weather forecast image. Customize your location, customize for your location and customize branding. And it gives an example of, I mean, it's just... the a seven day forecast basically uh in in an image that tells you the temperature is it rainy tomorrow you know that sort of thing uh for a specific city and then the pricing is anywhere from five dollars a month to a hundred dollars a month depending on how much customization you want to do um how many views you might have and i just i find it very interesting i mean you have weather overall as a niche right uh and then uh, <laughs> you have, um, you know, where you can look up weather as sort of another niche. Like this is weather just for newsletters. And it's only a tool that you embed into newsletters, right? It's not like, it's not even a website that you click on and you go look at the weather. No, it's like you embed this little widget in your newsletter. That's it. Like it's, it's super niche. Um, and how much money they're making, I have no clue. Uh, you know, I tried to do some Googling to see if I could figure out, you know, if they have a bunch of customers or anything like that. Um, I don't I don't have any idea. Um, they give use cases, right? So the type of customers that might do this, and it makes a lot of sense. You got hotels, right? That's in their newsletter. If you're planning to stay at your hotel, you want to know if it's sunny in California or is it going to be a torrential downpour? And you got to cancel your trip to Disneyland, right? Uh, so that weather in bed might be really important. Or an Airbnb or a sports team. Is the weather good enough to, you've got the big game, the playoffs coming next month, and you've got this weather in bed. Every time you get that newsletter, you're like, oh, okay, we're still good to go. So I can see um, for, for large businesses like hotels and things like that, it could be a pretty cool widget. So um, I did pull up the AHREF's graph. Um, I don't have it pulled up here now but i looked at it previously it's like essentially no traffic <laughs> like from search like it's there's like nothing um i looked at similar web and um it was maybe three or four thousand visitors a month right that was just coming from a variety of sources so not a ton of traffic i don't again i have no idea how big this business is but a very interesting kind of weird niche little tool niche website so I mean, at when I first, this just speaks to the power of being in the niche versus not. Like when I first heard it, I, I think, who is going to want to uh, have a weather embed tool in their newsletter? You know, but when you look at the use cases, all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, of course that would make sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, they could use a little bit of work here on the originality of their landing pages for hotel and for Airbnb and whatnot, uh, but. It feels like this is a little niche business that could purr along. Now, I don't know because there's no information here about the founder or about anything, but I've got to imagine that this looks like it comes from somebody who built it, like who maybe has a career or a history in the hotel space, right? Or in the travel mm -hmm. space. I noticed if you look at the bottom, they support and they have some of the big newsletters like MailChimp and Constant Contact and they have Revenate. And I'm like, what is Revenate? So I went and looked it up. Revenate is hospitality specific solutions that hotels bank on. And so, oh, you know, it, yeah, this is really almost built to work with solutions that a lot of these hospitality places are already utilizing is what it looks like to me. Yeah. Now, uh, here is one little uh, interesting tidbit of information that I didn't notice before we started recording here. Um, if you click on, uh, what was it that I clicked on? Some of the examples, I clicked on the use case of hotels. They actually have a whole paragraph here. Um, for SEO optimization. Yeah, I was going to so mention let me read that. that. 
paragraph. Yeah, it, was... it says, uh, <laughs> "Interesting." When it comes, yeah, when it comes to SEO content around weather forecasts, can naturally incorporate location-based keywords, thereby improving your local SEO performance. I guess the assumption is maybe they're in, embedding this on their website, right? And then have content related well, to that on newsletter. their website, <laughs> not just newsletter, right? Unless it's some sort of web-based newsletter. Um, it says this approach can aid your hotel in ranking higher in search engine results when potential guests search for accommodations in your area. Additionally, engaging content like weather forecasts can increase the time visitors spend on your site, a key factor in improving your overall SEO ranking. So there you go. It's an SEO optimization tool. They might want to change weather embeds for hotel newsletters because I, I, you know, it's, it, I understand what you're saying. Like maybe there's some different ways to use it, but newsletters and SEO don't typically go together. <laughs> Not typically. No. Right. So, um, I, but did, I just thought it, that yeah, was interesting. It is. I, I actually, I also like the line above it. I thought that was a little bit more on point The strategic marketing tools. You know, they're like, Hey, if you're a hotel, and you use this in conjunction with, say, promotions, it can really be a powerful one-two punch. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Like, it's going to mm -hmm. be hot out, you promote your pool. If it's going to be cold out, you promote your indoor restaurant, you know? And you kind of use these together hand-in-hand hand, if you can kind of create some synergy there. Like, that, that's, that, that's a good use. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know how much money it's making. I don't know how successful the business is. But it's um, maybe just, just an idea or sparks an idea for a listener out there of maybe not an exact replica, but what's a very niche tool that you could use? Maybe it's for newsletters. Maybe it's for some embedding, right? Is there something else you can embed for websites? Some little tool that, hey, you can charge people monthly uh, to, to use your little bit of technology. Um, so maybe there's some ideas that come with this, but uh, that's, that's my weird niche site. I mean, again, to me, it maybe makes a little bit of money until you start to think, well, maybe he's, uh, you know, pun intended, maybe he's embedded in the hotel space. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, he might like, speaking of a conference, like these hotel groups probably have conferences. I could see him with a little booth in the corner and, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. hey, you, you know, brand awareness and 50 bucks a month for a newsletter your size. And bam, you come home from the conference with, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 grand of, of, of monthly recurring revenue. Right. And maybe you sign up a hotel franchise, right? And then all yeah. of a sudden it's 50 bucks a month per location or something, right? You all know? of a sudden you just signed up 200 hotels. And it's like, Holiday Inn Express is like, I'm all over this, you know? And that's, right. that's a huge contract, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Exactly. So you land one or two of those big contracts with something like this. And absolutely, you're doing really well. So, well, my, uh, my topic is quite a different direction, my weird niche here. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, we all know IMDb, right? Internet Movie mm -hmm. Database, I believe is what the acronym stands for. Well, did you know that there is an IMCDB? I did not. Uh, Internet Movie Cars Database. That's the website that we have today. It's imcdb.org. <laughs> uh, did, did you hello, give me the link to Craigslist? Or yes, hello 2004. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Uh, Internet Movie Cars Database. <laughs> so is that what I think it is? So yeah, this is a like a Wikipedia of every movie and every car that was used in every movie. And I don't know if no it's every way. movie, but I mean that's certainly there's a lot of them in here. <laughs> Whoa. And wow. It's, it's really interesting. It's not very user friendly. I, I really wish it was. <laughs> um you know, like you can kind of go down the movie route or you can kind of go down the car route and it yeah. all breaks apart fairly quickly and i don't like if you're just listening like i don't mean that like they didn't do a good job conceptually i just mean like there's a lot of cars in the world and there's a lot of movies in the world and trying to kind of parse it all together it just doesn't user from a user experience doesn't do a very good job of it but if you start digging deep and just go like mercedes benz and then like the model you know and then you go like oh let's see the c class and then we'll do like the like you can just start to see like every and they have like screenshots from every movie of when every that's what car I was going to say. Used. Like when this, the car is on the screen, they've got a screenshot. So that's a lot of work. That's what I mean. This isn't just like a listing like, oh, the Aston Martin is mentioned in fifth gear. Okay, cool. No, they got like a screenshot of when it was used in the movie. And like you can actually see the, the, the image uh, of that. I mean, who's doing this? I don't know, but that is a lot of work. And 
I mean, it's not just like the Aston Martin. Like I had to click on the model, right? Like the the Laganda, right? And it's got I, I don't know. They're apparently, it's in <laughs> like twenty movies. <laughs> it's 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 really interesting. I mean, you know, they have all these different filters you can do. I mean, you can see in the upper right there, Spencer. They had display options and um, you know all sorts of different things that you can you can kind of you know uh, they have star ratings. I didn't know what exactly what the star ratings are. Are they to the car or to the movie or to their own stars i'm not really sure um you know but there's a lot of data here this is basically as classic old school directory as you can get right yeah it is so i think the stars are like how much is the car in the movie oh right this this is vehicle used by a character uh or in a car chasing and then one star is like background vehicle (laughs) got it okay so yeah if you really want a prominent Aston Martin uh-huh. Lagonda, Lagonda scene, you, you go for the three stars. That's right, right. You know, Fast and the Furious, right? You're getting a bunch of five-star cars. Oh, yeah. Anything yeah. that's in that in a race whatever. scene, right? Uh-huh. Uh, let's see here. My computer lagged a bit. I'm going over my notes. So, specs that people always like to hear. This will surprise you, Spencer, if you didn't cheat and look at the notes. DR68. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. You didn't okay. see that one coming, did you? I didn't. Out of left field. <laughs> Looks like a DR so. 6.8 if you look at the site. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ranks for 95,000 keywords. Uh, only about 32,000 organic sessions a month, though. So really, just again, broadly looking from at websites all the time, like when you have 95,000 keywords, you should be getting a little more traffic than 32,000 monthly page views. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that screen has 25. See- did you see what type of pages are, are getting that traffic? Like, yeah, it, um... it, it's it's really interesting. So you're not going to learn much from uh, going to top pages there. They have over uh, like 50 or 60,000 pages. But if you go into keywords, you'll actually see some of the keywords that they're ranking for. And they're really interesting. You know, It's basically like people okay. are looking for specific movies or mm-hmm. what I found more often, like the car they were using. It's so like the bad guy's car, um, Independence Day vehicles, um uh uh you know there's a couple other ones like harry and the henderson's car right so like hey mm. i saw that car in the movie and i don't know what car it is like i liked it or i thought it was interesting or i wanted to tell my friend about it like oh that's an aston martin uh laganda uh, you know i didn't know that you know so that they're ranking for all these queries that i never even thought would exist yeah that's really interesting um man just again talk talk about how niche you can go with these <laughs> yeah. search queries right um right and and new search queries being created right a new movie comes out next week all of a sudden you're gonna have all these search queries for oh what's you know uh, whoever driving in this new movie so uh monetize with ads obviously you can see the ads there i not over the top but you know definitely some ad, ad placement on the sites um and um I thought this was interesting. It also links on every one of the the the, uh, the the detailed pages to the movie where you can watch it. So it's like, go watch this movie on Amazon and all these places. And it's using what looks like an affiliate program called justwatch.com. Um, mm-hmm. So if you, you know, kind of hover over, let's see, I should have given you a link to, to watch the movie on, right? Um, there you go. Where to watch this movie on, what is that? Yeah, Roku. Uh, Down at the oh, bottom. Okay, there. okay. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so mm-hmm. yeah, and so it's got this, and I don't know anything about JustWatch.com, but I went to JustWatch.com and it looked very basically like you know one of these kind of shell affiliate you know, uh, you know uh, places where they can track you know your affiliate commissions uh, from referrals and stuff like that. So I yeah. don't know if they get a lot from that. You know, I don't think that the search intent or the user intent is quite you know like oh I want to go watch that movie now that I saw this grainy image of a you know like I think it's the other way around like I watched this movie and now I want to see what card yeah. it but you know they certainly have some different ways to earn revenue from the site yeah now this is just interesting do you know what year this site was created did you have 2004. to look that up uh, 2004 2004 2004 yeah. okay and this is the original design I believe yeah, it hasn't changed a bit. Um, I mean, updated the design um <laughs> It's, it's so fascinating. Like it has to be somebody's passion project. Like they love movies, they love cars. Let's put them together. It, um, it's great. <laughs> if um, just to put it in perspective, if you go down to the footer, Spencer, that's how I learned that it was um, it was started in two thousand four because the copyright date. Oh, and there you, you go. And at yep. the very bottom, the very last thing it says, page generated in point oh oh five seconds. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, Such a 2004 to thing to do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just need my visit counter here. Exactly. Uh, my, you know, to my GeoCities visit counter. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So, man, I love it. This is a good one. Um, yeah, something I never would have sort of thought about or certainly didn't know it existed. People are learning a lot about us, like that I'm not like a movie car buff, yeah. you know, and you other things, but um, I'm not going to ask you what car you drive. I actually don't know, but you and I probably have similar car tastes. I'm just going to guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt it's not an Aston want Martin. To share our car. It's not a <laughs> publicly. It's, it's not going to make us look we're both, better. We're in the both world. family guys. Okay. Yeah. So speaking like, of my stock going up, we're going to, we're going to stop talking about this. <laughs> that's, that sort of, yeah. Informs our decisions on some of that. Uh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, when my kids have moved out, I'll have much cooler cars. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, let's um, just say that you weren't that searching way. for your car in the movies uh, on screen just now. No, no. <laughs> Although maybe that's my next interesting query yeah. is who's driving this, you know, family vehicle. All right. Uh, well, very good. Uh, great share. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. We've covered the news, a lot of Google news, new things coming out. Um, you know, we've covered our shiny object shenanigans. And of course, our weird niche sites. We appreciate you guys listening in. If you are listening to this podcast, leave a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you are. Uh, give it a rating and a review so other people can find it. But other than that, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for being here, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Just a final reminder that it was brought to you by Search Intelligence. And if you're looking for link building PR campaigns for your website, just head over to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them today. Cheers. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the Niche Pursuits podcast. I just wanted to remind you that if you are ready to start building smarter, faster, and easier internal links, you should check out Link Whisper. You can get $15 off Link Whisper when you use the coupon code podcast at checkout. Head over to linkwhisper.com and use the code podcast in order to save $15. Thanks again for listening.